Hey everyone, and welcome to Another Bite, where we rewatch the most innovative and intriguing pitches from Shark Tank. I'm Jory, and I'm joined by the ambitious, the adaptable, and the admirable Ariel. Welcome back. After a long day on the slopes, the last thing you need is for your skis to shred the side of your car as they fall. Today's two founders aim to give powder to the people with their innovative new product. Slope and steady wins the race. Will the sharks hop on board or is it all downhill from here? We'll find out after we pay some bills. Marketing used to be fun. And with HubSpot's newly launched marketing and content hubs, it can be fun again. With tools like Content Remix to turn existing content into all new assets, lead scoring to shine a light on the leads most likely to purchase, and an analytics suite for out-of-the-box reports, it's quick to get you results. It's easy to use and it connects all your data. So put the fun back in your marketing funnel with HubSpot. Visit HubSpot.com to get started for free. Today in the tank, we have rig strips, and rig strips are brought to us by founder Steven and Zach, who are asking for $300,000 for 7.5% of their business, which is a $4 million valuation. The problem that rig strips is trying to solve for is that after a long day on the slopes, your ski or outdoor equipment could damage your car. So if you think about it, you're like laying your snowboard, for example, against your car as you're trying to open your door and figure out where to put it. And basically what this product is trying to solve for is sometimes that equipment can fall and then the edges can like scratch your car, scratch Mm -hmm. your window, and it's just a mess. So the solution is that rig strips is a magnet or sometimes it comes in an adhesive form where you can secure your skis, your snowboard, even your fishing rod against your car as you pack it up. So basically it's a ridged strip, if you will, that allows you to sort of slot your equipment in and it either magnetizes against your car or again, it can be permanently attached to it if you have an aluminum car. But it's just like an extra piece of equipment to just make sure that there's no damage after you're very tired and you've done your outdoor activity. They mentioned that they have a few competitors for fishing rods, but it is not something that has competitors at least for the ski and snowboard edition. They're mostly running as of the Shark Tank on meta ads, and they do have design patents and trademarks. So thinking about our pitch, our product, and our founders, Ariel, what were your thoughts of rig strips? Rig strip solves for a real problem, I think, that a lot of skiers and snowboarders face. So I love the concept of like being able to have a very simple adhesive to ensure that you're protecting your car. The fact that they have patents in place puts them in a Mm -hmm. position of defensibility. I hear what you say about like the fishing poles. I think there are different enough of affinity-based audiences that you wouldn't see as much overlap. Maybe a spicy take. Sure. But I think the fundamental challenge that I see with rig strips is that this is a one-time purchase product. Mm. Like this isn't something that, I mean, ideally, right, if the adhesive is working sure. great and like everything is holding things up. and if it's high quality. Right. You would only need to purchase this maybe once or twice if you have like a two-car household. Mm-hmm. So I think for me where I kind of struggle with this, is this actually a scalable long-term business if this is going to be their only product or is this a single product business, which we've reviewed before. But I think hearing from our founders, like I think they can't just lean into this being a one product kind of business or else they're going to run into challenges and kind of hit a wall over time because you're going to just only be acquiring new customers, but you're not keeping them in your life cycle somehow. They can try to sell affinity products like snow gear or like coats, which we see this happen all the time. But when you look at, you know, the data behind businesses that do that, that try to bundle similar products, they don't really sell very well. And then you have the same problem of we're focusing on too many different things instead of just our anchor products. So I think they need to kind of have a plan in place or maybe, you know, work with a shark to come up with a path to being a multiple product company, because I do worry that the efficacy of this product is actually going to be kind of a bit of a negative for them, Mm -hmm. especially when it comes to keeping your customers retained and having multiple repeat purchases. That's fair. I think they already have sort of the total addressable market of skier and snowboarders. I do think that that market is quite big overall. I do hear you though, in terms of repeat purchases, What I did love to see is that the founders seem to be listening to customers, which is where they get the sun strips, which is for the fishing rods. What I 
think they sort of will come up against, as you mentioned, is that they either have to keep innovating and coming up with these new devices because the repurchase cycle, you're entirely right. Unless a customer has a defective product, which is not how not you should a good be customer designing your product. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah, right. Unless they're buying the products from your other lines, there's not really like a easy repeat purchase unless they're buying for their friends and family. Mm-hmm. And maybe you could capture them on like, if you buy one, you get 15% off. But I understand what you're saying in terms of like, how are you going to keep people in your company and like still expanding it meaningfully? Mark gave this feedback as well, right? Where he was like, this seems like more of a product than a company. And again, unfortunately, we see a company that has branded itself around its core product, Rig Strips. And so they're going to even in the future have some issues with that especially if they expand into things like other ski equipment because their company unless they rebrand is still rig strips so i worry that they've kind of started to paint themselves into a corner even though it seems like it's a good product overall and that made me a little bit concerned we talk about this a lot in terms of like is it a product is it a company this seems like a product to me and for those reasons i'm out I'm going to challenge you there on the rig strips names. Okay. <laughs> is Ariel talking out of both sides of her mouth yet again. Tell me more. I don't think in this instance, naming the company off of this single product is the worst thing. They could come up with similar. They could do rig strips like large, like pro size for like different sizes or for different types of equipment. But then you have overhead fees. Then you have a bunch of products that is reliant on people having those types of vehicles. To an extent, yes. But if they had a rig strip for like, let's say like the top of your car for like kayaking. Mm, Okay. Like how many times do you see people like wrap up like a kayak? Like you could say I have rig strip water. Like that could be the series rig strip, like snow, water, earth. Like you could like come up with different. So your solution is just to name everything a rig strip and therefore it's not a problem? (gasps) To keep it in the ecosystem. I mean, I don't know. Okay, I'll take that. Uh, So you think that they should just name things to just keep it like rig strips as like the overarching branding. They could. I mean, look at Apple. Apple does like pro and plus after their names for like all these different iterations of things. But the iPhone isn't called Apple. Yes. You know, it's called the iPhone. That's part of Apple. But you know the I, when you see a lowercase I sure. next to where you okay. know that it's an Apple's ecosystem. So it's subtle branding through text. Okay. I think they could do something similar in their logo across like a product offering that like, kind of hints at it a little bit. Because like it sounds like from the customers that they do have, the customers really love the product Mm -hmm. so much so that they have a very open like feedback cycle with our founders. So like I think they kind of are stuck in like, okay, we're known as rig strips. So if we ever need to expand and take like our audience base, because they're not engaging constantly because it's a Mm -hmm. single time purchase, if they see rig strips for kayaks, which again, you can rename it to something a little bit sexier than like for kayaks, then they'd be like, oh yeah, I have one of these for my car. I haven't seen this brand in like years. That's so cool that they do this for kayaks. Like Mm -hmm. I think there's Mm -hmm. some ways that you can subtly tie that in to encourage repeat purchases across a broader product expansion. And, you know, as I'm thinking about it, I think you have a fair point too, because rig strips just assumes that you're attaching something to your rig, right? Which could be any car. So there's nothing in that specific name that's like so ski and snowboard oriented that it couldn't mean other things. I think they would just want to make sure that they are branding that well. Fair point. I'll take that feedback. (laughs) And, you know, hey, Even though I'm a naysayer, you know, they're selling product. They're pushing product because as of the Shark Tank, they've got about 60,000 units sold. And that equates to about $3 million in total sales. They've been around for a little bit. They've been around since 2020. But I mean, this year's projected sales alone, they're up at 2.7 million. So it's like clearly there is a use case this is solving for. They do have some kind of momentum in terms of their user base. I didn't think that it was like so expensive. Actually, I take that back. They are selling them at $50 a pop. Mm -hmm. It's not the cheapest product on the market, but they mentioned that there's some seasonality to the sales because they are seeing these bumps around November and December. I wish we got more of an insight into how they continue to build momentum throughout the year, because I think if you've got a bit of a seasonal product, then you have some issues in terms of scale later on. 
knowing again that these are things that people are only buying once. But maybe that's where the feedback of the fishing rods come in Mm -hmm. because fishing could be for the off season, I guess. So they have to find what are those sports that they can align themselves to. It's fishing a sport. It is, I guess. (laughs) Surely. It's on ESPN. Is it? Fly fishing? I feel (laughs) like there's some extreme competitive fishing somewhere. You know, I feel like when I was little and homesick during the day, I feel like there were certain channels streaming fishing events. So (laughs) Back when we stay home from school having a fever dream. Yeah, they call them derbies, right? So surely derby means that it's a sport. Who knows? Listeners, let us know. (laughs) Mark and I are on the same wavelength here. I don't know if you know that, but Mark Cuban and I, we we see eye to eye on this. You guys are besties. Yeah. He ultimately just was like, this is a product, not a company. I'm out. He's rich enough. He can paint everything in those sort of like black and white strokes. Kevin thinks that they're asking too much and it would be too much effort to get the momentum they would need to get his money back. So he went out. Lori, again, they came in at a $4 million valuation. But they were projected to make $3 million, right? I know. Hey, I'm Wait. just telling you what the sharks are saying. Okay. They're the business experts. I disagree. She said it was too high. Okay, well, you can invest. But it was Todd that actually, this one I was very shocked at. I guess I don't understand this man's portfolio at all because he was like, I'm a fisherman, I'll invest. And I was like, dude, you're the chicken man. Like, what are you talking about? I think his brand is just Southern. Oh, like, I think that's just like his That's true. Like, his whole thing is like, he's from Louisiana. So that's totally fair. With the fried chicken and canes and fishing, like it all yeah. fits that persona. Actually, you know, he is that persona. I see that. So Todd was like, I'm into this. We get a bit of a back and forth between Todd and the founder. He initially comes in at 20% for $300,000. They counter back and forth, ultimately landing on $300,000 for 15% of the business. So Rig Strips did walk away with a Shark Tank deal, at least a handshake one. And I think that they seemed pretty excited at the end. More so than I feel like they were when they actually got the deal. Yeah. My only thing is I feel like our core sharks not giving any deal... I think was a bit of a miss. Oh. You have a product that has great sales, great customer feedback. You have a proven model that works despite being a single product business. Like I get that our guest shark ended up with the deal, but I was very surprised from our four sharks to like not even see a nibble. Yeah, I will say both in the last season and this season, sharks They're more skeptical of companies coming in and offering deals. I think we're on sort of like the sharks in their conservative era where they aren't giving as much money. They don't like as high of valuations. The tightening of the budget era. Yeah. (laughs) Look at Lori budgeting. But they aren't offering as many deals to sort of like the out there products. And we saw that in terms of life raft and like the chicken ice cream. I feel like in the past, sometimes sharks would just like throw money at like hilarious products. I don't think that's the sharks of 2024. Yeah, that's a good point. Thank you. I don't know if you felt this as well, but it sort of felt like they kind of like initially walked away being like, yeah, uh, like I wonder if they wanted Lori or something Mm -hmm. like if Todd was their dream shark, because we get this sort of like post segment interview where they're like, yeah, Todd was totally our dream shark, but I didn't believe it for a second. I think they were after a little manufactured. Yeah. Mm. So I think they took a Mm -hmm. consolation shark, but You never know. You never know what Shark Tank will build you. But Rig Strips, definitely still available online. So if you're looking to get your holiday shopping done early, do I have the product for your dad? And yeah, very much still a company. We'll see where they take it. That is precisely who this is for. Like 100% this is for dads. Yeah, this is totally something that like kids that don't know what to buy their father Mm -hmm. are going to get them and be like, yeah, dad fishes, I think, right? And then they buy it. It's better Mm -hmm. than a coffee mug. So, you know, it's a step up. It's a step up. Except when dad has like 90 rig strips. (laughs) It's fine. Production for today's episode was brought to you by Ari Desarmo. Editing comes from Robert Hartwig and support from Alfred Schultz. Subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify Podcasts, or wherever you subscribe to the greatest podcasts ever. That does it for me. See you next week in the tank for another bite. I want to tell you about a podcast I think you might like if you want to succeed in sales. 
It's called Sales Evangelist, and it's hosted by Donald Kelly. Each week, you'll learn about the successful strategies used by the world's best sales experts and successful sellers. You'll hear from folks like Jeffrey Gittimer, Jill Conrath, Bob Berg, and Guy Kawasaki. You'll get actionable insights and stories that will encourage, challenge, and motivate you. If you want to take off in your sales career and earn the income you want, find Sales Evangelist wherever you get your podcasts.